All right, we're back with another video. Uh, today we're gonna uh, go through a couple of things on the front of one of these race cars, uh, correct procedures on how to measure stuff, how to mark a few things to get them where you want them to be, uh, how to get them to a neutral setting so that you can measure from there. Um, this is a 2008 Port City. This is one of my favorite generations of race cars. Uh, not necessarily the most successful race car that we've had, but as a driver, personally, the, the, the best feeling race car that we've had. Um, I really, really like that, that uh, 2008 to 2010 Port City generation. It was always a really successful car with us. And I know that there's a lot of cars out there now that are, you know, a lot more expensive. That doesn't mean that they're better. Um, these race shops have to come out with new stuff every year to keep selling you something. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's better. Yeah, they have more technology, but has it worked for you? Did you recently purchase a car that not necessarily is faster than your old car? You kind of struggle with it more, but it's newer, so you got to have it. I don't kind of buy into that whole theory. I like to stick with what I know works, and I do experiment a lot. And if I see something that is a definite benefit, um, I integrate that into what we're doing. But what I mainly have is I have my baseline. My baseline is where I go back to every single week and then we can make adjustments from there and try to tune in and if we don't like where we're going with it, we can kind of go back to our baseline and set ourselves back into a, a regular direction. Um, I have not uh, switched over to solely bump stops. I know guys are on bumps on all four corners, you know, they're really aggressive. Um, a lot of our tracks in the Northwest are, are worn out. Let's take Yakima Speedway for example. It's a rough track and it's it's gotten rougher over the years and I see that you know a lot of these guys that are running really aggressive bump stop packages um, as the race wears on they tend to overwork the right rear of the car they try to get that car to pivot you know they're 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 stopping on the left front on the right rear and they're trying to get that car to get around the corner and ultimately it transfers too much load to the right rear and it wears the right rear tire out and long run they suffer um, I am not near as aggressive on some of those setups, but I feel like my cars from the midpoint of the race to the end of the race are better because we kind of protect the tires a little bit. I'm, I'm not near as aggressive on my right front. I'm not near as aggressive on my right rear. You're never going to wear out a left front tire. So, you know, if you can put some more wear into it, some more load into that tire, by all means, go for it. But a lot of times when you put load into that left front, it transfers it to the right rear because these cars kind of work diagonally. So if you're going to stop your left front with a really aggressive bump spring or a bump stop, a lot of times it's going to push that right rear into the ground more and it's going to increase the wear and the temperature on that right rear tire. So you got to be really careful with that. So like I say, my baseline is more of a conservative baseline. I do run bump springs. I do run, you know, minimal bump stops, but I don't typically rely on those. I rely more on my springs. To do this, uh, I'm more of a roll center based setup guy. Um, there's, there's two main forms of of front end geometry. There's a roll center type geometry and then there's a jacking type uh, force, jacking force type uh, setup geometry. With just a couple of minimal changes to my upper A arms and my pivot heights because everything's slugged. Um, not only my my um, my A plate, you know, vertical adjustments are slugged, but I've also got a caster slug. Plus I can go to either side of that A plate. Um, I've got slugged spindles on several cars so that we can change that. You can change uh, ball joint pin lengths. So with just a couple of adjustments and I've got a complete set of spare A arms that is set up for more of a jacking force type front end, I can flop that thing over at the racetrack literally in 15 minutes. Um, know where my caster's at, know where my camber's at, know where a lot of this stuff is and bolt that setup in, go out and try it. And if my driver gives me the thumbs up or the thumbs down, we know which direction he, he's looking to go with that for that day. And there's a lot of times where the weather changes this. You know, if you may have a, a track that's overcast one weekend and you see, you know, these benefits and these changes work. And then the next weekend it's under, you know, heavy sunlight, a lot of track temperature, greasy racetrack, you know, different setups work for different days. Humidity plays a part. Humidity is basically an insulator. Um, when there's a higher humidity, um, you know, parts of the car maintain more temperature longer. They, they increase temperature quicker. Think of humidity as like, like I say, an, an insulator. So when the, when there's humidity, then when there's wind, wind is a major factor. I don't think a lot of guys take wind into as much account as it actually plays. Say that you're on a bigger track and you've got a crosswind that goes across the racetrack in the middle of the corner. Um, a lot of guys are going to get down that corner and they're going to go, man, my car just so tight. It's just so tight. Well, what it is, is that's the slowest point in the racetrack and that wind is shoving you up the track. 
So guys will adjust to the wind, adjust to the wind, adjust to the wind, and then when the sun goes down and the the wind dies down, their car is just loose as hell because they can't get it. They 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 freed it up to get through that wind, and now the wind's gone and it just over rotates. So you got to look at your surroundings, look at the weather. Um, I look at the weather constantly. In fact, I used to do weather updates every day on my way to the racetrack. Um, I still talk to my drivers and my crew guys about what the weather's doing because weather is a factor. Everything is a factor. If you're on old tires this week versus new tires, that's a factor. Um, track temperature. There's so many things. Um, drivers, to me, are a major factor themselves. You can have a driver that's just on it one day, and then on another day, he makes more mistakes. Um, that's just how drivers are. That's just how racing is. And um, it's not it's not a stick and ball sport where you know you get a couple cuts out of baseball. Um, you might hit a home run. We have to do the same thing over and over and over and over. And every time a driver makes a mistake, it's track time. It costs us time on track. When you cost yourself time on track, you can't get that back. So you got to minimize the mistakes. Um, you, honestly, with racing, you just got to be perfect. You got to be on it. And by making your race car better, you will find it easier to hit your marks easier to, to, to get back to the throttle correctly, not overwork the brakes. The brakes are a major factor short track racing. If, you know, long run, you're using a lot of front brake, you build that air pressure up, the car starts to get tight, um, which causes you to use more brake, unfortunately. It, next thing you know, you're blowing rotors, the thing won't turn. Um, because it won't turn, you can't get off the corner. Uh, it's just a, it's a downhill spiral. So, little things definitely make big things over a longer period so always keep that in mind manage your brakes manage your tires manage your your you know your wheel input that's another one if you're if you're getting into the corner and you're jabbing a bunch of wheel to it the car gets free it's not loading the right front tire um, a lot of the older guys would always tell you know if if you know when you've been racing your teacher always told you hold a pretty wheel be smooth on that wheel if you get down the corner and you're jacking on that wheel and your car's bobbing and weaving it's not increasing the load on that tire that right front tire, see and load, losing load, see and load, losing load. Or if you get in the corner and you're free in and you're not able to turn to the left, you're turning to the right, that tire is not seeing that load. You've got to get that load into that tire for that tire to bite. Having your front end correct is, is a major advantage. So the first thing I do when I'm setting the, uh, uh, the front end up, I don't have an engine in it, I don't have a nose on it. To rough it in, um, to try to measure this thing with an engine, it's, it's impossible. Even if, you know, you got plumb bobs, you're marking the floor, doing all that, it's very difficult to be perfect. And when you're measuring the front of a car, say a ball joint, you're trying to visualize where the center of that ball joint is and to measure to it. So, you know, if, if you can't even see the ball joint because you got brake ducts in the way, you got shocks, travel indicators, you got, you know, headers, you got all this other stuff, it's going to be absolutely impossible to pinpoint the middle of that ball joint. So before I get the nose on it, before I get the engine in it, I always get it on the plate and I always get through and I get all my measurements and I get it as close as I can. You're not going to be perfect because you don't have the weight on that tire like the engine would have. You know, that tire isn't squatted out. I do take the air out of my tires to a certain point to get them where that I need to be, where I anticipate them being with the weight in the car. Um, but there is a bit of a guessing game uh, on a lot of this. So the more you do it, the, the, the closer your guesses will be. Um, keep notes on all that stuff and it's just like anything else the more you do it the better you're gonna be at it so I'm not gonna give you exact numbers what I run because my numbers aren't gonna work for you you've got to build your own setup and I could tell you to I'm blue in the face exactly what I'm doing but it's not gonna work for you if you don't know how to apply those things so start a notebook start taking measurements uh, record those measurements and and build read articles um, talk to other guys uh, see what they're doing and and start to put together your own package the more effort you put into this the better you're gonna be if you put in minimal effort you're gonna get back a minimal return put forth the X the effort maximum effort maximum return I start by squaring my rack so you want your rack to be squared between your lower pivots as you can see here this bolt it, it may look like it's out of line because the the direction of the camera but I can assure you I've, I've gone through, I've gotten this side aligned, this side aligned, so it's centered, and then I marked it. I marked with where my steering shaft um, lock bolt is, I put a stamp mark. I used my punch to put a pivot or to put a, a divot in that aluminum so as to know where to line up my rack. 
I also put a dent, a little ding in my frame with that same punch that marks the center between the lower pivots. And then to make sure that my rack stays centered, I put a mark not only on the clip, but on my rack as well as the spacer in between the two. I know it's difficult to see, but by marking those points, you can always get back to center, always get back to zero. And when you go back to zero, that's the first place you start by making adjustments. If you go to start making adjustments and your rack is way off to the left or, you know, stuff is just out of whack, you're, you're never going to make gains because there's a variable there. After you get the rack located, you could put a couple of clamps on the steering shaft to keep it from moving so as to keep it centered so that you know nothing changes there. I don't have them on this one. Um, this is a brand new steering shaft. I don't really want to mess it up, but I'm on my plate and I have always check to make sure I'm straight here. So it's really not a major necessity for me at this point. But when I go to do setup in it and I have the weight in the engine, I have the weight, you know, all, all in the front of the car. To make sure that that doesn't move, I will lock it down because at that point, it's hard to see where I'm at with the balancer and, and all the other crap hanging off over in front of the rack. By measuring between the two pivots and marking it, I know exactly where my center is so I can hang my, my plumb bob, line it up with that ding mark in the, in the cross member, and I've always got my string in the center of my car. Now, this is a difficult one to see, but you can see right there where I put my, my little ding in it. All I use is my punch, my sharpened punch. I set it where I, I know it's at. I put a ding in it. This right here, what I had done is I have a measurement from the shelf of the ball joint to the center of the ball joint. I took that measurement, I marked it, and then I use my straight edge to mark the center line of the ball joint vertically. At that cross section, I put my, my uh, punch and I dinged it. So right there, all I have to do is run my tape measure up to it. I've got my vertical height. I can run my tape measure to it from the center point and I've got my right measurement. On a double A-arm type suspension car such as our super late models, um, a lot of street stocks are double A-arm. On a strut it's quite a bit different. I'm not going to cover the strut, I'm just going to cover the double, the double A-arm type suspensions right now. But every pivot point, and there's eight pivot points on a double A-arm car, um, each pivot point has two measurements. It's got a vertical measurement, which is basically height from ground, and it's got a left or a right, which is the measurement from center. Let's take, for example, this lower inner pivot point. This point right here is nine and one eighth inches from center. This is a common because the center point on those two pivots is 18 and a quarter on most super late models. Uh, you take that center point, you divide it by half, and it gives you your two lower inners. That point is a, is, is a constant. That point does not move. That It may move up and down, but that does not change its side to side. So when you have this from center, then you have to measure it from the ground, and then you have your lower ball joint. Your lower ball joint from center and your lower ball joint from the ground. Same thing with your upper ball joint and your upper frame pivot. Both sides have eight measurements, 16 measurements in total. Here is the Performance Trends Roll Center calculator that I use. Um, I know it's nothing Razoo or fancy or, or modern even. Uh, I've had this since, I don't know, 2003, 2004. I've done it on this program ever since. I've got tons of files. And personally, I just like to stick with what I've got, uh, what I've used, and what I know. Uh, changing stuff and, and trying to modernize may not be the best way to go about it every time. This is a car that I, I literally just threw this together just to kind of give us an idea. None of these are actual measurements. Um, just because, like I said, I can't give away the stuff that I do. It's not going to help you besides I've got customers and um, I, I don't want to upset anybody by giving away my, my good stuff. But what I can tell you is typically this is a this is a front view. So it's like looking at the front of your car. You can see the left front camber here, the right front camber, and you can see the roll center. The roll center is the black dot. The moment centers is the blue dot is the right side moment center. You can see how your right front arms intersect and create that blue dot. Um, your left front arm is your red dot you can see the intersecting lines there also and then they intersect with the patch to give you your moment center and the two intersecting lines create your roll center so like i say i just kind of threw this together this is nothing uh nothing real uh, actually nothing real at all um just for idea's sake when you go through and you're looking at your roll center and you go and drop and and roll so this is your travel, and I'm going to go ahead and drop this thing. Let's say drop it just a half inch, just for starters, half inch. 
and you can see how the roll center moves. The idea is to keep that roll center from moving far at all. Usually they're to the left and you know you can be above ground or below ground but regardless if you're running on springs and you're running a roll center the goal is to keep that from migrating. You want to keep that thing as close to a non-migration or as close to in you know your, 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 your relative point as possible. The more that moves the more it changes the car. Another thing is, this is why sway bars are so, so, so effective. Um, watch what happens when I start introducing roll to this car. This is only um, two tenths, four tenths, five. You see how the things start to move? It, what it will do is it will start to pull that roll center to the right. Anytime that roll center goes to the right, it starts to load the right front tire more. So if you, you know, if you, if you forget to set your sway bar, which we never forget to set our sway bars, but if, say, you don't have the bar hooked up or the bar uh, unlocks, uh, the car's going to get wicked, wicked tight because it's going to yank that roll center all the way to the right and tighten the car up. Making sure your roll center is 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 right making sure your your landing on your sway bar is right this is why you look at all the cars they land as flat as possible they want to keep them as flat as possible to keep that roll center from jamming over to the right what happens is the car starts to lean over and you lose camber on the right front so if your car is sitting flat you land and you've got say six degrees of camber on the right front and you roll over one degree you've just effectively lost one whole degree of camber on the right front so getting the car to land flat on the sway bar even if you have to you know raise the right side frame heights and change the rake in the car a little Little bit to do that um, getting the car to land flat is a major major benefit when I'm measuring a car I will spend hours on this program trying to get my um, my car to be exactly what I want you can change a arm lengths by you know uh, moving these pivots around over here you can change you'll see the actual a arm length there uh, on the bottom you can change the height of these pivots. You can change the length of this ball joint, this ball joint. You can move this pivot up and down. But, and again, like I say on the super late models, this is nine and an eighth. I just threw this together just so that we can kind of get ideas on, on what it looks like. But um, I will spend hours on this program trying to get the front of my car where I want it and, and to respond how I want it to through travel, through roll. Um, this is a long process. You're going to spend years learning this. I've been doing this for, for a long, long time, and I still learn things every day. So um, it's you got to have patience. But like I say with everything else, the more effort you put into it, the more return you're going to see. After I get my string hung for my plumb bob and I've got my tires set, I've got everything ready to go to start measuring it, I'm going to kind of fill out this little block. So I've got right, height, left and height right here i've got my upper ball joint ubj lower uh, upper frame pivot ufp lower ball joint lbj and lower frame pivot lfp so i'll start i'll measure all my right all my heights all my lefts and all my heights again then i'm ready to put it into the computer i know this sounds like a tedious project but um your foundation is so important on your race car. Anytime the engine comes out of the car, I've got it back over here and I'm measuring it. Anytime the, the front end gets damaged, like if I got damaged, the right front tire gets knocked off, I've got this thing back over here and I'm measuring it. There's no sense in going to the racetrack and not being exact. And by being exact, the adjustments I make to the race car give me more feedback and let me know that that was a positive change or it wasn't a positive change. Um, it, it's a long process. You just gotta, you just gotta learn it. There's no quicker way to learn it than to start measuring stuff and recording that data. Now that we've covered our roll centers, let's look at real quick what cambers do. And I know this looks really primitive, but it's the best we got for now. So when you're rolling through tech or when you're at your static height, your static height is where the car doesn't see any load. This is about what your tire sees. It's on the outside of the left front. It's on the inside of the right front and your cross member is up. As this cross member travels down, what will happen is the tire will load up and it'll actually kick more angle into the right front, but the left front will straighten up. The right front sees a ton more load, like literally probably, well, maybe not quite a ton more, but it's definitely seeing several hundred, uh, maybe a thousand pounds more load. What it's doing is it's deforming, and by pushing this tire into the ground, it deforms, it increases the footprint of this tire, and it's more effective because it's using the inside and the outside of this tire. 
The left front tire, however, it stands up because it doesn't have near the amount of load. It still sees this distortion, but it's not quite as bad as the right front because of the, the lower load numbers. The idea for the left front is to get to where you're using the inside of it as much as possible, but not taking the weight off the outside of that tire. The outside of that tire causes that tire to dig and cut through the center of the corner, just like the inside of the right front. By using the outside of this tire or the inside of the left front tire too much, you will cause the car to lose front grip. Sometimes you see cars that are severely, severely over cambered on the left front. Uh, rolling through tech, but when they're on track, it's where they're at for their target. That's where they want to be um, A lot of things like the geometry the upper a arm um, You know more jacking force you tend to run a shorter left front upper a arm You need more camber in that left front tire to get it to operate correctly correctly in travel now on the right front It's kind of the same thing. You'll see guys that have a longer right front arm They'll start with more static camber guys that have a shorter right front arm start with less static right front camber um, again jacking force you're going to want a longer right front arm shorter left front arm and it adds to that jacking uh, when you're doing a roll center you tend to have a little bit shorter right front arm to keep the migration in check whereas with a jacking force car a longer right front arm you're not really worried as much about the migration as you are about the leverage you're putting on the left front tire in jacking force type cars where you've got that shorter left front upper, you've got to run some sort of a stop. Um, I've never seen guys run jacking forces without running some sort of a left front stop or a cons considerably higher left front spring rate. The reason is because this car kind of, it, it's jacking, it's actually forcing itself down on this left front, which is basically forcing this left front up in the wheel well. Uh, by doing that, the cross weight goes up. The car sees a lot more cross weight past its center, right through its center and just past its center. Um, and for that reason, it kind of makes the car lazy. By having a bump stop and stopping this car at its travel, you're able to keep that weight on that left front. You're able to keep that car digging through the corner. Um, and then it relies on its shock from there. So if you're not allowed to have uh, bump stops, bump springs, typically a roll center is going to work better for you than jacking forces. If you're allowed to run, you know, bump stops, you're allowed to run really, really, really aggressive shocks and springs. Um, you can get away with the jacking force, but it's all, like I say, personal preference. I don't typically run a lot of jacking force. I set my cars up on a roll center, but I do set up the cars so that I can easily slide over to a jacking force if I feel like it's going to be more beneficial. All it is, a couple A arms, some measurements, and if you go through and you do all your measurements, your your bump steer, you have all that stuff done ahead of time, you can make notes on where it's at, and it's easy to switch over. You're putting your car together, regardless if you're running a roll center type setup or if you're running a jacking force type setup. The the setup process is kind of an evolution. It's kind of a it's kind of a circle. Um, you can't set your bump steer until you have your caster right because caster by setting your caster raises your steer arm or lowers your steer arm and your steer arm height is your bump steer. You can't set your caster till your camber is correct. You can't set your camber till you have your geometry correct. So you get your geometry, you get your cambers, you, you're roughing your caster. Um, you kind of got to do this stuff and then you go back, you recheck your pivots, you recheck your roll center, you recheck your camber, you recheck your caster. If you have to make a change, you, re you redo it. I mean, it's just kind of a process back and forth. And then when it's all done, then you can set your bump steer, um, your, your toe, your sway bar, all that other stuff. Like I say, it's, it's a cycle and it takes a while to learn, but don't try to jump the gun on any one process over another because it's going to come back and bite you in the end. In this situation, because I don't have the engine in it, I don't have the hood on it, or the, the, the body on it, the radiator, all that weight is out of the front of it. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm really focusing on my pivots, on my roll centers. I'm making sure that I've got travel and everything, that everything moves freely and there's no binds in it. Um, and when I get this all locked down and we're ready to put the engine, the hood, the radiator, all the weight back on this thing, it's going to make my final setup a lot easier. That way, when I get in here and the car is all done, I've, I'm already, I'm 90% on my geometry. I'm 90% on my cambers. I'm really, really close on a lot of stuff. Then I've just got to kind of fine tune it. But even at that point, when I'm fine tuning it, again, it's a cycle. I don't want to, you know, make a, a big swing at something. I got the camber right, but then I lost my roll center. So you got to keep going back and measuring those. As you can see, I set the car down in full travel. I basically put the crossmember on the ground, 
and then I went through and I made sure I still have travel. By making sure you still have travel, you know that you're not going to bottom out a ball joint. Um, Everything is going to work freely like it should. Yeah, it is tight, but the cross member is on the ground, and my plan is to run that cross member about a quarter inch from bottoming out. I don't want to get all the way to the ground. Um, over traveling is going to hurt the roll center on this car, so to keep that from happening, I am going to short travel it just a hair. But at this point, I can look at where my ball joints are. I can see that my ball joint isn't going to bind up. I've got good movement there. I still have plenty of travel left. The lower ball joint is just perfect. This side, the ball joint, again, looks good. Had I ran a zero uh, degree A-arm, I may be close on this ball joint to bottoming out. But with a 10 degree on this side, a 20 to a 25 degree on this side, I'm not going to have any issues with my travel. The one place where I am close is on my tie rod. I did notch out the frame there for the tie rod. You see that a lot on the new cars. Um, there are a couple of companies like Wears Machine builds a kick down lower tie rod or a, a kick down tie rod to keep this from happening. But again, I don't have my bump set. I think I'm a bit high on that. So by the time I'm all finished, I'm not gonna have any issues with bind. I've got free travel everywhere. And uh, ultimately it's gonna work out really well. As you saw me uh, race that car, you saw me put the block back underneath the right front. I've got blocks on all four corners of all my cars. It's just the best way to keep them from moving around when I'm setting them up. But I don't just have one set of blocks. This is, uh, the black set is my set of four inch height blocks, which would be my, they're not just four inches, they're my four inch ride height, they're my static height, what I would be at if I uh, basically measured the car going through tech. Um, I never set the car on just four inches all the way around. It's just it doesn't work for anything I do I've got my four inch setup blocks, which is four inch on the left front You know four and a half on the right front four and three-eighths left rear wherever um, That's just my setup block. I've got another set of setup blocks. That's uh, the blue set, which is my maximum travel blocks um, They would basically show if my cross member is just basically touching the ground um, plus my maximum travel in the rear and then I've got my checkered set, which is my zero ride height block set. My zero ride height block set is for, you know, some of the tracks that we run. They don't make us fit like a four inch frame height on the left front. Um, they let us have leeway there, so they don't really check any heights. So I would set it up at that height, which would be my uh, target height, uh, plus a little bit of room for uh, some extra loads. So... I've got multiple sets of blocks. I strongly encourage you to uh, get block sets for these cars if you're going to run, you know, 4 inch or 5 inch or whatever your frame height is for the car that you're running. Make sure that you've got uh, ample blocks to get through all those scenarios when you're setting up. Last thing I'm going to cover is after you've got everything done, you've got everything where you want it, uh, your ball joints are located, um, you're, pit you're happy with your pivots, you've checked your anti dives, you've checked all that stuff. After you get everything exactly where you want it, go through and make sure that you've got a lock nut on everything. I do not use nylocks just because like in a situation like this where your header is at, your header may come really, really close to this and it'll burn the nylon out of that nut, potentially allowing your suspension to come loose and put you out of a race. So I will either run a stamped lock, top lock nut or a um, serrated backside flange nut. The nice thing about the flange nut is it spreads the load out from that nut and sometimes if you have like a flat washer and you have a, just a standard nut on there and you crank it down tight, uh, that washer will kind of bow out and, and it doesn't provide the support. So by having a flange nut, you just uh, ensure that you've got that load spread out and it's not going to come loose. Plus the serrations on there lock in and they keep it from backing off. Or having a top lock nut um, where it pinches the, the actual shaft of the bolt and it ensures it's not going to come off there. Just running a standard nut with a lock washer I don't feel is sufficient and absolutely in no circumstance by anywhere hot will I run a nylock. Um, there, I've had races taken from me for silly things failing and by going through and taking that extra step to make sure that you're not going to have anything come loose bolt check everything and where cotter pins where they're uh, where they fit if you have a, a uh, like on your uh, castle nut for your ball joint make sure you're using a cotter pin on that don't just tighten them down the theory is that tight bolts don't come loose and that is true but heat and vibrations of these race cars do play a major effect on the bolts of these things and and staying tight so don't run any risks there 
put the good bolts in, use grade eight where you can. Um, remember grade eight are a little bit brittle. So in some situations you may be better off going to a grade five, but make sure you're using a good nut. Use a good top lock, stamp lock nut or a shouldered serrated nut. Do not use a standard nut or an eye lock. There are a lot of little things that we will cover later on that I did not cover today, like anti-dive. Um, each A-arm has its own anti-dive. The anti-dive is basically the angle of the cross shaft or the angle between these two pivots on the lower. The lower doesn't have a cross shaft, so it's the angle between those two pivots. We'll cover anti-dive and how it works. We'll cover uh, caster gain, how that works. Um, Ackerman. Ackerman's another big one. Um, a lot of guys run more Ackerman in the left front, but because of slip angle, which that's another one we'll cover down the road, because of slip angle and the, the, the load on a tire and the slip angle is so determined upon that load that um, Ackerman is a, is a factor, you know, in how you approach things. Um, there's a lot of little things and it, there's so much that it's hard to cover in one video, but stay tuned, um, subscribe, like the page, um, hit the notification button, and as we cover those things and those videos pop up, you'll be the first to know about it. And hopefully down the road, this kind of stuff will make your car better. It'll make you better as a racer. And, you know, I've said in other videos, we spend a ton of money going racing. Don't shortchange yourself by not going that extra step and making your race car right. Go through those steps, follow those processes, and um, the, the one that's going to benefit is going to be you.